Uh, my name is Professor Chris Alden. I'm a uh, co-director of the LSE Ideas, and we're here today uh, to talk about, um, to introduce and talk about a, a, a interesting topic, Rethinking UK Policy Towards Conflict Lessons, uh, being presented by the Conflict Research Program here at the LSE Ideas. Uh, we've got quite a, uh, a big audience and a, and a great array of speakers today. So let me start by introducing them. First, Professor Mary Caldor, who's the Principal Investigator of the Conflict Research Program and Professor Emeritus of Global Governance. Uh, Professor Caldor has pioneered the concept of new wars and global civil society and her work on the practical implementation of human security has directly influenced European and national policies. Professor Dr. Alex Duvall, Executive Director of the World Peace Foundation, Professorial Fellow here at the LSE, and also tied to the link to the Conflict Research Program. Rim uh, Turkmani, who's a research director for, con for the Conflict Research Program, was doing work in Syria. Julian Riley is the UK Special Envoy for the, for the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea, and then as serving as a discussant, uh, Professor Christopher Coker, who also is co-director of LSE Ideas, who's a professor of international relations at the LSE, retiring in 2016, I mean 2019. So if I could begin by uh, inviting uh, Mary to, to speak to the research work that uh, uh, on, on this issue, and uh, if you could take it from here. Thanks. You're still muted. Hello, thank you and welcome everybody. I'm going to present the main findings from the conflict research program uh, that are relevant to uh, the integrated, the government's integrated review on defense, foreign policy and security policy. Uh, we have submitted a major paper which I think was circulated to everybody and we're going to try and summarize it today. We've been working for years uh, in five sites. We've been studying the drivers of conflict and uh, external intervention and trying to find out what works. And our five sites are Congo, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Somalia, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, so what is the main thrust of what we've said to the integrated review? Well, the main argument is that conflicts are very important and they're very important not simply for human rights reasons, not simply because we as human beings ought to be deeply concerned about the plight of the victims of these conflicts. Uh, but also because these conflicts are deeply integrated into every other global challenge you want to mention, whether we're talking about refugees and asylum seekers, uh, whether we're talking about organised crime, whether we're talking about terrorism, uh, whether we're talking about pandemics and indeed our recent work on COVID-19 as an example suggests that conflict areas are the least able to cope with the pandemic and this has really alarming implications for the global transmission of the illness. So that's what we're trying to persuade the government to give priority to addressing conflicts but we're also trying to uh, put forward ways in which they we think they need together with others to do that. Um, and I think most importantly, what we're trying to say is that it's very important to see conflicts differently. There is a tendency to assume that conflicts are deep rooted political contests in which each side wants to win. That's how we traditionally think of war and they're ready to go to the end to achieve victory. What we argue is that you need to see conflicts today much more as a sort of social condition or even as a sort of social system in which you see multiple armed groups, literally hundreds of groups in places like Syria or Congo, 
all of whom in different ways gain from violence itself rather than from winning or losing. They gain in economic terms, they gain in political terms because they can perpetuate uh, ideologies based on fear through violence itself. Uh, and they can gain in economic terms through loot, through pillage, through smuggling and all kinds of activities that happen during war. And so these conflicts, if, if you like, the old version, the version of a conflict as a political contest tends to extreme levels of violence. The version of conflict as a social condition tends to persistence. They're terribly difficult to end because so many different groups have, an in have incentives in violence and they have a horrible tendency to spread. And so this is the real challenge. Uh, what we've tried to do in the conflict research program is to establish a conceptual framework for trying to analyze the social condition. Um, and what we do is we talk about public authority, which could be a state, it could be a municipality, it could be an international institution. But what we're interested in is what we call the logic of public authority. How do these public authorities function? Do they function in ways that help to dampen down violence or do they function in ways that produce violence? And we, for the purpose of the program, we've identified three logics. And one is the logic of what we call the political marketplace. This is very much Alex's conception and Alex will explain it a little bit more. But basically, the political marketplace could be described as transactional politics, monetized politics, crony capitalism. It's where people are in politics for money and for the resources that politics gives them rather than for, say, contributing to the public good. The second logic, which we find goes together with the political marketplace, is exclusivist identity politics. And that could be sectarianism, Shia versus Sunni, for example, or it could be ethnic nationalism, um, Nur versus Dinka, for example, in South Sudan. And what we find in all our sites is not only that identity politics sort of seems to go alongside the political marketplace, but also that these kinds of exclusivist identity politics are actually a consequence as much as a cause of violence. Uh, Alex's work shows how the clan system became entrenched through the violence in the early 90s in Somalia and more recent work in Somalia, in, in Syria, shows how the Shia Sunni distinction was constructed both by government and opposition through their narratives and through the patterns of violence in the early years of the war. And then the third logic that we talk about is what we're calling civicness. And civicness isn't just an ideal, it's actually something you empirically find in all these conflicts, precisely because they're a sort of social condition. They're fragmented, they're decentralized, and we do find local authorities who've tried to keep out of the conflict and try to keep public services going. By civicness, we don't mean civil society. We don't mean NGOs, though NGOs may well be civic, but they could also be subject to the political marketplace or identity politics. We mean all kinds of people who behave in civic ways, for instance, doctors who act, and nurses who act impartially, journalists who try to tell the truth, lawyers who aren't corrupt, judges who aren't corrupt. Um, we also mean local authorities who work on a civic logic, or we could mean protest campaigns that protest against the combination of the political marketplace and identity politics, or in their words, corruption and sectarianism. So if you start trying to think of conflict in these terms, what are the implications for policy and first of all what it means is that policy has to be multi-level, uh, multi-dimensional and multilateral. 
instead of a focus on top down. At, at the if you think of conflict as a political contest, then you tend to focus on top, a top, reaching a top down peace agreement, which is supposed to solve the problem. But if you think of it in these terms as incentives to violence, then you need to work at all levels of society and your aim needs to be to try and change this social condition, to try and weaken the political marketplace and identity politics and strengthen civicness. And what we do in the paper is we illustrate what this might mean for a whole range of external interventions for justice, for sanctions, for tax systems. Let me just, and I won't do more because of time, mention two examples. One is peace talks. If you go for top-down peace talks, then what you get, first of all, it's very, very difficult because there are so many armed groups. But if you do succeed in bringing them together, as in, say, Bosnia or Lebanon or in the TIFE agreement, what you do actually is to freeze the social condition. The armed groups will only join if they can continue their predatory condition, predatory activities, if they have a permanent position in government. So you set up a system which perpetuates the social condition, perhaps with less violence than during the height of war, but in some cases not less violence. I mean, in Congo, the violence has been worse after the peace agreement than before. But that doesn't mean you don't talk, but what it means is that you need to think about peace talks as a process. You need to seek, you need to aim less at some future constitutional arrangement and more at reaching agreements which will improve conditions on the ground, like lifting sieges or having local ceasefires. It needs to be multi-level. You need to involve all the great powers, but you also need to involve local authorities. And it needs to be exclusive. If you only talk to the armed groups, um, it would be, I don't know, uh, it, it would be just taking the, an agreement among extremist organisations. Whereas what you need to do is to involve the mass of people. So you need to involve civil society, civic individuals. And the second example, which is very similar, is security sector reform. Um, in a political marketplace, security sector reform is just a method through which armed groups get integrated into armies and get access to money and status. Indeed, we have examples in the Congo where groups actually formed armed groups in order to be included in the security sector reform process. But we do also have examples where security sector reform worked where it was possible to build civic coalitions, both within and outside the political institutions. Now, and, and what that means is that external actors should try to work to create and support such kinds of coalitions. I'm sure we'll have more examples in the discussion. I want to just finish by saying that it, you know, the, this kind of a policy does mean that we need a much more, uh, we need a new set of capabilities, we need a systems approach, we need to bring in many different kinds of actors, development actors, medical people, uh, police, as well as peacekeepers and military people, uh, though trained to do things differently. But I think one thing that we really emphasize and we, it, it, it's reflected in our own methodology, is the huge importance of research, of really understanding the conflicts from below, of doing granular research. And it's hugely important to involve local researchers, which we do. We've created a kind of infrastructure of local researchers in all our sites. And they argue that there's a real need to decolonize research. Uh, to use the phrase we've put in our evidence. So those are the main points I wanted to uh, make and I'm sure other people will add and people will want to ask questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Mary. It was uh, very, very clear and concise. And as you said, uh, uh, an opportunity for our other speakers to 
to uh, take some of these ideas further. Could I turn to um, Alex uh, Duvall, please, to, uh, uh, who has disappeared from my picture, but I assume he is hidden there somewhere. I'm still here, yes. Ah, okay, good. If you could uh, uh, comment, please. Thank you. Um, I thought I would say just a, a few words about the political marketplace framework. Um, elaborate a little bit on the key concepts and then explore um, implications in, in a couple of different uh, thematic areas. So um, as, as Mary indicated, the political marketplace is, is, is the term we use to describe the, the sort of the contemporary version of patronage politics. Old style patronage politics was slow paced, the deals that were made, yes, they were transactions with material gains on both sides, but they once established, they, they remained largely in place over a long period of time and they were confined almost always within national borders. Um, and the rewards that were given to the, the, the local elites, they could be financial or they could be symbolic. They could be um, awards of status. Um, the, um, the, the, the British system with its peerages would be a great classic example of this. Um, the current system that we have, it differs from that in that it's fast paced, integrated across borders and dollarized. It's, if you like, the ultimate manifestation of uh, neoliberal capitalism in that political power, political loyalties, political services have become a commodity to be traded in, in, in the market. It operates at different levels. It operates regionally. We see in the region that we are engaged in a certain number of the, uh, for example, the Gulf states in, and, and Iran as well, intervening across borders with financial patronage, also with, um, with arms, in order to, to, to secure uh, at least short term uh, political and military services and perhaps longer term uh, loyalties. Um, we've seen this in Syria, in, in, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, and in the Horn, and the Horn of Africa. So it's, it's transnational in that respect. Um, and Russia is also actively uh, engaged in its own, in, in, in its own way. Um, it's dollarized. The, 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 um, the payments are, are, are convertible uh, uh, across uh, different locations and currencies and very, very fast paced. In extremists, we see something like a conflict gig economy where groups are formed in order to get certain forms of, of political leverage and, and, and to act on that. The, key the three key concepts really in the political marketplace framework. One is the political budget. That is the money that is available to a political actor in order to dispense for political services, for which he, and it's a very gendered system, they're almost all men, for which he does not have to account. He just goes, buys loyalty, doesn't report back. And this money can be quite small in comparison to the overall political economy. So you could, in principle, have a, an agrarian political system in which most of the state revenue came from agricultural exports and taxes, and only a small amount was actually in the political budgets, let's say from artisanal mining or from um, international security assistance that was flowing across borders. The, what happens in the general economy, if it is not captured by these political budgets, isn't relevant to the political marketplace. The political market is driven by that specific amount of money that is captured for um, discretionary use by members of the political elite. And it will be clear that some forms of, of political organization and, 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 and revenue are much more easily captured than others. Oil is a good example, minerals is another, um, external assistance, especially security assistance, is a, um, is, is a third case. So that's the political budget. The second is the price of loyalty. And this is, this is subject to market forces, to, to supply and demand. And of course, also subject to how the market is regulated, whether it's a, a, a monopolistic regulation, in which case the controlling uh, political power is able to regulate entry and regulate pr prices or an oligopoly, where you have several actors maybe colluding to keep others out 
or it can be a free market. And occasionally at particular moments, we see that with a, a low barriers to entry, people flooding into the market as, as it were, political startups. And, the, and depending on supply and demand, the number of buyers, etc., the price can fluctuate. And then the political skill of the operator, the number of, of, of people he, again, very gendered, he, he knows and, 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 and his ability to anticipate the fluctuations in the market. A very turbulent system. The concern of the political operators is staying afloat. It is not navigating to a destination. This is a system in which short-term transactional politics, immediate gain or immediate survival trumps long-term public goods. So even if a political actor enters the market with an idea of the public interest, with an idea, a, a genuine intent to, to pursue a particular agenda, which is non-material, say building an Islamic state or providing services to the community or achieving human rights and democracy, only those who can compete with those short-term transactional well-financed operators will survive. And what we tend to see is the more ideological operators becoming more transactional over time because of the needs of, 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 of survival in that market. And of course, being ideological gives you a particular brand and brands are important in any market. Now, how does the, the what are the implications of this? Let me just give a, a, a couple of examples. The first is an example of a popular uprising, and I'll give the example of Sudan, where you have a popular uprising and mass mobilization to overthrow a dictator. And the leaders of the, the uprising saw this as the representing the will of the people, wonderful ideals of human rights, dignity, democracy, etc., as against autocracy and corruption. And what we hope to do with the political marketplace toolkit, the set of tools for analyzing what's going on is to say, hold on a moment. You know, you may think you're on a trajectory from autocracy to democracy, but you may also need to analyze your situation as a trajectory from a well-regulated centralized kleptocracy, which is what the Omar al-Bashir regime was, admittedly one in crisis, and I'll get back to that in a minute, to a political market reconfigured in a different way, either as a free market or as an oligopoly in which those who had control over those key instruments of political finance would actually determine the trajectory of the country. And sadly, what we've seen in, in the case of Sudan is that because the, those who led this wonderful non-violent non democratic revolution didn't have in their hands the instruments of financial control, both of the general economy and more particularly of the political market. They've always been at a disadvantage with respect to the, their counterparts in the military, the crony capitalists and the players in the region that have the immediate money. So the, the, um, the uh, wonderfully technocratic, enlightened Minister of Finance, who was appointed as a, as, as, as by the revolution, a civilian, was, he resigned a few months ago because he was unable to crack the power of that oligopolistic cartel of the military commercial entrepreneurs who controlled the key elements of um, the, the shadow economy and therefore had the money. So the central bank governor, when he wanted to pay salaries, had to go running to these military operators who had the money in hand. They could pay out a short-term cash in hand in order to keep the system running. And of course, so we have a situation that the civilians are in office, but those who have the real money are actually those in power. And we see an internationalization, a regionalization of this in that the, the, in order to survive, the Sudan government needs to get off the US state sponsors of terror list. And in order to do that, the US wants something in return. And what it wants at the moment is for Sudan to recognize Israel. And the Emiratis would like that too. And so we see a lot of pressure coming from um, 
the United States now for Sudan, recognize Israel and we'll get you off the state sponsors of terror list. And maybe we will then um, be able to save your democratic revolution. Um, of course, the story is a bit more complicated, but in a nutshell, that's what it comes down to. And sadly, I think we've seen other popular uprisings running afoul of these types of transactional politics. A second case, I've got three cases, so I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, is humanitarian crisis and response. Now, the starvation is generally driven not by political market transactions, but by military strategies in war zones and by the wider political economy of, of that renders people vulnerable to impoverishment and, and, and destitution. Where does the political marketplace come in? I think there are two elements that we can see. One is the, the resistance to reform. Those who want to reform economic systems or deliver public goods, including humanitarian assistance, are always at a disadvantage compared to those well-financed, unscrupulous, uh, political market transaction politicians who can deliver short-term uh, results. And this is a, a challenge to, for humanitarians. It's a possibly insuperable challenge for uh, Democrats and uh, local technocrats, unless they are given sufficient international clout and backing in order to roll back and overcome this wave of short-term transactionalism. Um, the other driver of, of humanitarian crisis is a local manifestation. Of, of the political market, which is where you have local conflict actors who are able to pursue um, extreme agendas of dispossessing, looting, destruction, um, financing themselves by uh, depriving uh, other communities of their basic means of livelihood and sustenance. Um, a third area I want to point to is traumatic decarbonization. We are dealing in many cases with countries that are dependent upon oil revenues, Iraq, South Sudan, Sudan until recently, etc. cetera. Um, and these countries, as the price of oil crashes and will not recover, have to shift to other sources of revenue. And this brings me back to Sudan because it was the shift from an oil economy in Sudan to a gold economy that created the, the, the crisis that overthrew President Bashir, in order for him to secure the resources he wanted for political purposes from gold, he needed to do two things. One was to empower the militia who controlled those areas, which led to the rise of the paramilitary rapid support forces, who became the kingmaker in Sudan. When their leader, General Mohammed Hamdan Hemeti, turned against Bashir, Bashir fell. And the other thing was that in order to, to buy that gold, there was an inflationary strategy pursued by the monetary authorities. I won't go into the details, but what the inflation did was it deprived the, the wage earning class, those dependent on, on income in Sudanese currency, impoverished them and rewarded those who, who, who worked in the smuggling informal sector who had access to gold or hard currency, making them the true power brokers. In, post, in, in Sudan at the time of the revolution, uh, 18 months ago, and indeed today. So that shows how this analysis allows us to understand some of these trajectories. And then finally, what does this mean for UK policy? It means we need to understand the world as it is, not as if we would like it to be, and to recognize the, the, the way in which the wave of transactional politics is actually undermining so many of the institutions uh, and principles and norms that keep uh, the, the uh, peace and security and, 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 and a beneficent economy ticking over. So we need to reinvest, I think, in, in, in global norms and institutions and the issues that Mary um, was describing. Let me leave it at that point. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, a very useful elaboration upon some of the, the particular concepts and, and uh, providing examples that illustrate it. If I could turn to, to Dr. Uh, Rim Turkmani, please, if you could uh, take your uh, position there.
Sure, thank you, Chris. <clears throat> uh, as Mary explained, the, one of the outcomes of our research is that contemporary conflicts uh, can largely be understood as a pervasive uh, social condition in which there are multiple actors at play, as opposed to a deeply rooted political contest between two sides, where the aim of the two sides is outright victory. So what follows from that is that two-sided peace talks just don't work. And we've seen many, many conflicts, uh, you know, the, the top level peace talks of an UN led, uh, you know, lasting for a very long time without any outcome. But in all these conflicts, we also observe that they are on the sides. There are civic actors who are trying to um, uh, infiltrate this negotiated space and have a space for themselves on the table or have their voice uh, uh, being heard. We followed one of these successful uh, examples where the civic actors managed to find a place for themselves at the top level negotiations. And when I mean, uh, when I say civic actors here in civil society, I don't mean, as Mary explained, the uh, necessarily the NGOs or the organized civil society. This could be the active lawyer or the doctor who's trying to resolve issues in his area or even um, some of the uh, uh, religious figures who are trying to broker local ceasefires. It could be anyone who's trying to invoke civic values and uh, 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 help in resolving the conflict. So in the example of Syria, and let's say until roughly 2015, the UN uh, led peace talks uh, or mediations approach were privileged the top down efforts to bring together two opposing sides uh, on the table. Now, over time, this was not working, not leading anywhere. And there was persistent civil society and civic actors knocking on the door of the mediator. Back then it was Stefan de Mistura and saying, listen, we have different views. We have different approaches and the two sides don't just represent us. Uh, so they argue for establishing a kind of a civic board or body that can be complementary to the process. And eventually this was established. They called it the civil society support room. Uh, uh, it's a very flexible mechanism where through which uh, the UN regularly invite members of civil society uh, from all areas. So it was very, very inclusive process. It departed from this binary setting. Uh, so it invited people, uh, actors, civil society members from all the uh, geographies in Syria and from different political points of view, uh, different ethnicity, different sex, and they put them in one room. And they say, fine, now talk, come up with a solution, tell us what you think. And they, those guys used to come, every time there are talks in Geneva, they will come and participate, sometimes even when there are no talks. And they keep changing the people every time they bring, bring more people to make sure everyone is inclusive. Now, originally that was meant to be a complementary process. So we studied this process, we surveyed it, we uh, sent questionnaires to, to all participants, and then we interviewed them as well. And the outcome of that was a little bit surprising to us because what was initially meant to be a complementary process seemed, it turned out to be a process on its own right. For the participants themselves, they felt it transformed them because they were sitting on the table with people who they thought they completely disagreed with. I think that we're having technical difficulties here. Rim, can you, can, we might be able to hear the audio. Can you hear us? Okay, while, while um, we have to get uh, the, the um, video back and the audio back, um, Perhaps what I could do, ah, through the magic of real life, <laughs> she appears. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Do you want to sit on yes. my seat for a little bit? <laughs> so, hello again. <laughs> so what was the last thing you heard from me? We, he, pick up where you were two minutes ago, I think would be right. On the civic, uh, you were talking about, uh, in the Syrian case, the civic organization. Right. Yes, so... And uh, you, we sent questionnaires. Okay, so we, we sent questionnaires and to all the participants, we interviewed them, 
And, um, you know, they say, what they say to us is that they really found the participation itself and being in a room with all those people who they thought they actually will never be able to talk to, uh, they found it very transformative. So uh, sitting in one room from completely different uh, uh, political sides, they were able in a very, very civilized way, really, to uh, agree on solutions, to come up with ideas, very constructive ideas. Uh, uh, they uh, broke all the barriers between each other, and that was very, very helpful for the mediator. I mean, the mediator was, you know, suddenly uh, become aware of where are the areas of ag potential agreements that he can put on the political table, what are the really sensitive issues, because during this debate on the civil society support room, all the sensitive topics come up, and uh, so it was like a... Uh, um, uh, a way to explore the mind, the mind fields, you know, uh, a mind finder. So the mediator became aware of sensitive topics, how to approach them, where are the solutions, where are the area of agreements, and most importantly, they, it, it, the, this room broke the binary of representation. This claim by the two authorities, opposition and the regime, that they represent people was broken. So none of them was able to say to the uh, mediator that we represent the people and this is what the people think. Because the mediator will then say, I was in the civil society support room and I heard different view, a view that is more rooted, uh, you know, uh, in the society. Uh, the second thing where it was very, very helpful process, it, it created this multi-level peace talks that Mary was talking about, the needs for multi-level talks. So the civil society support room was all, almost working on the mezzanine level. So on one side, it's strongly connected at the top level with Geneva, with all the mechanisms, mechanisms created by the international community, including uh, ceasefire monitoring room, including the humanitarian action task force. Uh, so they were on one side connected with these uh, top level mechanisms, on the other side, they're connected with the ground. So, and they were often able to connect the two in a very, very creative way, inviting, for example, uh, the UN or Red Crescent to immediately intervene in a village where there's an issue about the uh, uh, security of the participants when certain militia withdrew. And there's so many good stories that showed actually the connectivity really increased and that for people on the ground suddenly felt that the top level process actually is bringing mean meaningful uh, uh, change for us. Um, so, um, I mean, in brief, uh, it was very good example on how to break this uh, binary of representation in peace talks, bring, bring something meaningful out of a peace talk. Of course, the conflict is not resolved, but uh, it was a positive contribution, let's say, the civil society uh, one, and it to, uh, it helped address the deep rooted the issues uh, that drove the conflict uh, rather than keep you know presenting this conflict as two sided uh, uh, conflict that once one of the sides uh, have to win. Um, finally, I just want to comment also on what Mary said about the granular knowledge because of our belief that. Uh, when you talk to the people on the ground, especially those civic actors we love, you know, like, you know, we have so many people, for example, we talk to in Syria, like the lawyers who keep going around everywhere, trying to resolve issues, talk to every people. Those people are connected, they know the ground and they have solutions, they have ideas. And we think that harvesting knowledge through them is key to any research that aims to put meaningful political solutions on the table and political recommendations. But the problem is in conflict zones is access. You know, how do you access those people? You know, difficult security conditions, uh, the technology keeps uh, breaking down. You don't want to put people at risk. Uh, so we designed an um, innovative approach uh, to resolve this issue at the Syria team. We call it mappingsyria.org or .com. You can uh, find it online, which is um, a platform, a digital platform platform with very detailed questionnaires about all the issues we care about, including the legitimacy of actors, who are the actors, uh, what's the situation of the education or the health sector in each single area in Syria. And this platform can be accessed by uh, a network of activists and civic actors on the ground who 
which we established through a circle of trust. So we know every single one of them. Uh, uh, we train them. We written guides for them how to answer these questions. They access this platform. They answer all the questions and we get it here immediately in London. And through this, we know much more about who are the actors. We know what do they think? What does the civil society think? Who do they think has legitimacy? Where do you think the uh, solution is? And this tool is helping us immensely in not just understanding what's going on on the ground in different areas, because the situation is dramatically different between different regions in the country, but also in uh, when we talk to policymakers, we bring real knowledge and we put practical solutions on the table. Thank you very much. We, we had a practical solution to that video problem too. <laughs> Good example of it in action. Thank you. Um, could I, I turn to, to Julian Riley, please, to uh, comment uh, on, on uh, what we've spoken of so far? Right. Um, am I now um, audible and there, just before I start? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Very good. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, first of all, a huge um, thanks um, to everybody um, that uh, the whole paper and, and what you've just presented uh, provides a huge amount of uh, material and analysis. Um, uh, you've given me quite a major task now to try and respond to as much of that as I can. I think what I'll do, first of all, is just uh, just say what an extraordinarily valuable contribution it is to thinking about how we frame conflict, looking at the nature of conflict integrated with the wider global challenges, really useful coming at the time of the integrated review. Of course, thinking is still going on that, so we will see exactly where it comes out. But I, I think um, for me, I thought really interesting that uh, looking at the the third track of civicness alongside the alternate logics of, of the political marketplace and exclusive fist identity politics has been uh, really useful. So in, in commenting, I'll just sort of a few general comments, a thought um, on how um, this kind of uh, research uh, can impact on, on government policy making. Um, then uh, some thoughts on the recommendations and then a little bit perhaps uh, on some specific examples, in particular drawing on my own experience uh, working across the Horn, whether that's Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan and more. Uh, first of all, just say you know, I agree with the broad recommendations in uh, the paper. I think it's really important uh, to think about the perverse incentives in conflict, which which do turn it into a social condition and therefore require a different approach to what I hope is now the old fashioned approach uh, uh, of seeing two sides and not something which is that uh, we in government would, would usually see in these new complex conflicts with which we're often dealing. Um, so as I say, it's um, some of the thinking I, I like to think is becoming and has become part of, uh, of the HMG approach. I'd say for instance, in in South Sudan, uh, where as well as the national level, actually look at the regional, the national, the sub-national, the local approaches and trying to restructure the new uh, peace, uh, peace agreement framework for tackling that, but also the other interventions uh, which we and other international partners are doing, try, trying to reshape those in order to address some, some really difficult uh, challenges, uh, particularly around those, those, those uh, political marketplace and um, uh, and identity politics challenges which which don't get any easier um, and I wanted to come back to some of that on Sudan shortly as well uh, but first just some thoughts about actually how we in government can use the kind of thinking which which you've so eloquently presented today and in the paper I think a challenge uh, for policymakers is how we turn the good analysis into effective policy and action. Um, so perhaps just to reflect where, where the UK government is on that, um, 
I think that the formation of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the FCDO, trying to bring together, well, bringing together diplomatic and development strands of, 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 of UK government activity is an important further step towards being more than the sum of our parts. Um, and I hope that it will enable us uh, better to reflect on and absorb the kind of thinking uh, that we are discussing today. Um, I think these are these are challenges which we've been, you know, working at for a long time. I might flag out the formation of the stabilization unit a long time ago, trying to bring together different elements of uh, government and uh, non-governmental uh, work together. Um, the work that we saw in the, the fusion approach um, and that we had in recent years and now the SCDO. Um, the other thought is just around the challenge of ensuring that we have the local knowledge necessary for the granular and holistic approach to individual challenges that you recommend and which which actually for instance in uh, when we adopted our new strategic approach to Africa um, a couple of years back one of the big ideas behind that was was the need for more granularity more local knowledge absolutely endorse what you say about uh, local networks local researchers ensuring that we have all those proper information all that proper information but also managing uh, to slot that into a, a strategic approach at the macro level of the sort of global and wider regional level and then the last challenge is is finding and then deploying the right tools to do all of that much easier said than done uh, before just looking at some of the recommendations, just a, a brief thought on, on, on the value of the kind of input uh, that the um, conflict research program has, has, has provided. Um, I think an increasing focus in government on data and analysis driven foreign and development policy um, needs the kind of external inputs and engagement which this offers. There is a question around how we in government can most easily be most easily absorb and use this that's partly about our own structures and systems um, it's probably also about um, how um, products are designed and written to maximize their impact so uh, my brief plea which i often make to all who um, often know far more about so you know the, the deep experts it's really important uh, to construct um, practitioner friendly formats, um, short, punchy, clear. Um, we um, like um, it when the necessary input and the desired outcome are really clearly linked. Um, things like what you have, a two page summary, which provides the key recommendations, is really good, particularly for the, the ministerial and the senior official market. Um, long reads get a much more get a much smaller and, and, and more specialist audience, um, which is absolutely vital um, uh, for feeding in on the policies. Um, but actually uh, products like the blog, which you, you, you put out just ahead of this event, I think are really useful in pitching and summarizing complex ideas and, and getting that debate going. Um, so just on, on some of the thoughts there uh, in the paper, um, there's a bit of a question for me back to the panel um, as, uh, when we get into discussion about are there new and different forms of civicness that we in government should be focusing on more? How do we think about reducing the risk of, of, of co-option, including co-option by elements of civil society when they are brought in? Um, there's questions around how the international community taps into or promote and or promote civicness beyond structured organizations or, or, or find new ones. And so Reem's comments on, on, on the Syria process were very interest, interesting. We're also looking in South Sudan ourselves about how we can do that more. And I think in Sudan, there's some really interesting examples there. So that's on the idea of uh, civicness. Uh, I just wanted to com comment on the flexible, flexible programming idea and uh, making sure that we're avoiding unintended clashes between uh, different logics of conflict. Um, of course the fusion approach and trying to 
bring together all of the different elements of, of government thinking so that we're thinking about um, humanitarian development, inclusive uh, humanitarian delivery, inclusive development, sort of counter extremism, security issues, and stabilization all in, in one go. But we, I think, the more external evidence and research that we have on this is going to be really important for both developing the theory and designing place specific action. Um, I couldn't agree more with the recommendations around um, security sector reform, DDR, etc. I think back to lessons that we've all learned um, from the implementation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Sudan, stroke South Sudan. Um, where we can um, get things right or better next time, though how you shift the, the logics of, of public authority is going to be a big challenge on that. In Somalia, I think there's some really interesting ongoing lessons that we could talk about. And in Sudan, I'm picking up on some of what Alex has said, I think there's a chance to, to try and find ways to ensure that civicness and understanding of conflict as a, a social condition uh, is a chance for the international community to look at how we can better support a process, including in security sector reform, that, that supports a shift to peace and does not incentivize or, or, or give credit to those holdout groups with the guns or the big groups, etc. Uh, some of the, the thinking around tax and resource use, I think, is hugely important. And um, perhaps I'll come to that um, just talking a little bit now about Sudan, where the whole macroeconomic reform program and what needs to be done, of course, whether or not it will be done is going to be really important. So just on that specific, and I'll, I'll just finish on the Sudan example, I and mean, I could talk more about South Sudan or Somalia, but I'll leave that for later. Um, first of all, couldn't agree more, uh, Alex, with your uh, recommend, well, <laughs> adage that it's important to recognize the world it is, it, as it is and to engage with that and not what we wish were there. But I also think it's really important to recognize that the, the political transition in Sudan is an outcome of and an opportunity for a shift in the balance of logics of public authority and therefore an opportunity to try to empower and therefore create a greater role for civicness. Um, and, and, and whether or not we're looking at the centre periphery challenges, the urban rural, you know, how do the neighbourhood committees uh, that drove the popular revolution engage with the established parties, which now risk losing some of their support if some of the sensible economic reforms go through? How do you balance the civilian and the military? And you've talked about you know, the, the splits between there. So secondly, um, we need to think about the role and the risks of economic reform in supporting that transition. And I think that's that's key to addressing you know, the risk of, of, of reversion to conflict. So subsidy reform, redoing the tax base, all highly contested, um, in, including by you know, forces that say that they represent sort of democratic transition because it's difficult and it will change the balance of power. But it's a chance for real change. And then at the international community level, whether or not that's at the regional level, where, uh, and some people don't like it, and some people just recognize it as a fact, you know, our, our Gulf partners are critical to this. Um, and there may be variances of, um, of interest, but we need to engage everybody. Um, so it's looking at how do different countries view support and how can an HMG policy, in our case, help shape a collective international community of response, which both acknowledges civicness and bottom-up processes, but also recognises the constraints of reality of what both power brokers within the country, but also within the region, want to see. Um, and on that, because it has been mentioned, I would just say, uh, from a UK perspective, uh, I see uh, our Gulf, um, you know, the Gulf as, as partners in a longer term project um, because they have to be. Um, and so it's about and, 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 and they were critical actually in enabling the transition to happen. We then need to 
look at the balances. What are the tools that are available to create gr a greater role for civicness uh, within that uh, process? And I'll finish there, but just 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 saying on on South Sudan, actually, I think that there is a groping towards the whole issue of civicness, and the fact that it is a a halting progress just underlines how incredibly difficult it is um, when you have sort of deeply entrenched entrenched political marketplaces and 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 exclusivist um, identity poli politics to move away from that. So. It would be really good if this discussion sort of could address actually what the practical tools are and how we can reshape approaches to tackle some of those challenges and the realities. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sure the panel will want to uh, come back to you on, on some of those uh, questions. But before I do that, I'd like to turn it over to, to uh, Christopher Coker, who, who will speak further to the issues. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. I'm aware that uh, time is running out and um, I, I see on the screen that there are quite a lot of questions coming in. So let me be uh, pretty brief and to compliment what Julian has just said, but wearing my academic hat. I think to reiterate with the great value of this study to use an academic uh, term is that um, it, it uh, privileges um, process norms over particularistic norms. In other words, it, it asks, how do we get from A to B? How do we get from war to peace rather than what, we sh what should be done to achieve peace, which is very much the top-down approach. And this allows for what is absolutely critical, I think, in a very fluid situation, which is flexibility. Um, but uh, discussions, of course, have to raise problems, <laughs> have to problematize. Um, so uh, can I just raise four uh, problems that I've identified that the panelists might like to address or perhaps will come up in the q and I mean, the first thing is, is Mary talked about the, uh, the outlying, the, out, uh, the under, underlying three logics of all of this. Indeed, I wrote a book myself called The Logic of Great Power Conflict. The problem when you're dealing with logic is it's max of determinism and, and, and a certain degree of deductivism. So. Uh, my first uh, question to the panelists would be, are we really discussing a logic of conflict or are we discussing dynamics of conflict, uh, such as patterns of behavior? Because logics are unchangeable, but behavior changes all the time. And in the 10 year period that um, the, the paper sets out to, to look at, uh, we will see, of course, changes, environmental constraints, uh, economic opportunities opening up which aren't available today and economic opportunities which are available today, perhaps closing. So that would be my, my first question. Um, it, to what extent can we use this term, the logic, uh, these three logics that Mary set out so, so well, which the paper of course discusses. The second question is about strategy. Um, there has been of course a lack of strategic thinking and strategic foresight in all Western governments over the last 25 years, uh, and a degree of element of short-termism, of course, in policymaking, uh, which is very much part of the post-Cold War uh, pattern of behavior. So since the paper asks uh, Western governments, particularly the British government in this case, to look forward to um, a, a policy that can be pursued consistently uh, over 10 years, are we asking too much? But as, as somebody who, who teaches strategy and is involved in strategy, of course, I'm also aware that there are many strategic thinkers who believe that you can't do strategy uh, in the present age because of the fluidity of the situation, um, because identities will change uh, in this 10 year period. Um, perhaps uh, even the commodification of, of the marketplace will change in this period. Um, this is an enormous challenge, I think, to, uh, to all governments uh, when they're trying to set out policies. So that's my second question. Um, can we think uh, and, and commit to um, a strategy over a 10-year period? 
My third question is, is, is that I was very much aware of the, the greed versus grievance debate. Um, when we're talking about the commodification of, of the political marketplace and identity capital. But I think what, what is very, very valuable about this study is, is the civics, which is the key difference, and particularly the very constructive approach that the paper adopts, not just identifying the spoilers uh, in the civics uh, element, uh, in the logic, if you want, of civicness, but also the good guys, if we can call them that. In other words, people who are actually committed to uh, some form of civic participation. But again, I'd like to ask from an academic point of view, to what extent um, the authors of this paper would say, see their approach as different from that of the, of the greed and grievance uh, school. Um, and my last uh, question is, is really about wicked problems. Now, this may be a a concept which has had its day, uh, and it was popular 10 years ago. But when I was reading the paper, uh, there seemed to be many elements that supportive of this, a kind of non-linear approach, uh, non-definitional, in other words, that the situation defines itself, no best solutions against the top-down approach, of course, uh, how actors, even the worst actors, we might consider the worst are a part of the solution, how we ourselves, if we are intervening, uh, governments from the West are intervening, become part of the problem. Um, there seems to be a lot in common uh, with this concept of wicked problems, but if you think, if the authors think this is an unhappy uh, conceptual framework, um, to what extent would they uh, differ in this approach? And my very last point is a very practical one, which is about the European Union and the UK after Brexit. Uh, and of course, I'm aware of the fact that in the global uh, strategy, which the EU adopted in 2003, it described itself as a, as, I think, as a facilitator of global civil society. And, and Mary, in her introductory remarks, made it quite clear that civicness is, is, is more, uh, and perhaps even different in some respects, from global civil society. But in its second uh, global uh, strategy report, uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 2016, the year that we decided to leave the European Union, um, it talked about principal pragmatism. So what do the panelists, the, the, the authors of this paper see as the EU's very specific contribution uh, to dealing with conflicts of this kind, assuming that the EU probably has more to contribute than the United States or China or Russia or any other actors? And, and what would be the relationship of a post-Brexit UK with this. Uh, we often say that uh, post-Brexit UK may be more European uh, in its uh, policy choices, uh, precisely because we've left the EU for, for many, many reasons. Um, when uh, the paper talks about the UK's 10-year plan, if you like to call it that, which is an unfortunate term, probably, and it's my responsibility for using it, what is its connection with uh, the EU um, post-Brexit? And I'll leave it there. Super. Okay. Um, we, we have actually, in the form of the two uh, uh, last set of comments or individuals' comments, we've got quite a number of, of, of ferment here that we can draw from. There are also some questions coming in from the audience. I think it would be fair first to allow the panelists to answer what the discussants have put forward and then bring it to the wider audience. So if I could start uh, with the panelists in uh, the order that they originally spoke, so starting with Mary. Gosh, thank you. And there's lots and lots to comment on. And thank you for these really interesting contributions. So I'll try to answer some of them. Um, first of all, to Julian on his very interesting question on civicness. Are there different kinds of civicness? Well, one thing that we have come across is looking at the protest movements in Iraq, Lebanon and Sudan and comparing them with 2011. Um, I think 2011, it was much less clear what people were demanding. They were probably demanding a change of regime, although they were also demanding human rights. But in a way, what is so interesting about the current uh, protest movements is they are demanding an end 
to the political marketplace and identity politics. They're demanding an end to corruption and sectarianism. In Iraq, the main slogan of the protesters is, in the name of religion, they are looting us. And it is so interesting to see that this analysis, which we've come up through from a long research process, is very similar to the analysis of the protest movements. And the other very interesting thing about this generation of protest movements is the hugely important role played by women, which is something very new. And in Iraq and in Lebanon and in Sudan, the women have insisted on being the front line because they feel the security forces are less likely to attack them as women. And it has turned out, at least in Sudan and Lebanon, to be a rather effective strategy. In Iraq, they seem to not mind killing women. Um, but so that's one difference, and I'm sure other people could mention other differences. I think the risks of co-option are huge, and that's one of the reasons I distinguished between civicness and civil society. You know, the international community got all enthusiastic about civil society and started creating NGOs everywhere. And the NGOs did what the donors wanted rather than what they needed to do in the context of their situation. And so there's a huge problem of co-option. And I don't have any very simple answer, but my point is really that you don't always throw money at issues. That the real point about these civic actors is that we need to see them as partners in addressing the conflict rather than as good people who need to be supported. And I think that's a good way to try and think about it. Um, I'm not going to answer all the questions, maybe other people will as well. But I do think Christopher's questions are really, really interesting. First of all, on the issue of logic versus dynamics. Actually, I do think we're interested in logics because, but I don't think it's necessarily determinism because what it allows us to analyze is the evolution of different processes. And what we try to do is to look at contradictions and problems that open up what Alex and his colleagues are calling critical junctures, where it's possible to act. It may be that the situation is very determined and it's very difficult to do anything but mitigate the situation. But what we find is there are real contradictions between, for example, the logic of the political marketplace and the logic of identity politics. While they tend to go together, while political marketplace entrepreneurs like to frame what they do in identity politics narratives, identity politics narratives have a habit of having a life of their own and mobilizing people in directions that aren't necessarily useful to the rational calculus of the political market entrepreneur. And that opens up possibilities for civic interventions. So I do think logic is actually rather a useful term because it, our, our aim is to show, not to sort of naively say, well, we have to stop identity politics and identity uh, and the political marketplace because we can't do that. We need to look at their logic and try to understand moments where we might be able to intervene. Um, on strategy, this is really fascinating. I think that's why you need a civil service, actually. And this is one of my concerns about the merger between the Foreign Office and DFID. It seems to me that DFID had been building an analysis over a long period, which is quite in tune with a lot of what we've been saying. And, um, you know, you mentioned, or oh, Julian mentioned the stabilisation unit. I think about the work that DFID did with the local administrative councils mm -hmm. in Syria. They have developed a kind of expertise. And what I really hope is that the merger will mean that this expertise becomes more political rather than that the short term political concerns swamp this expertise, because <laughs> if you like, you could think of the Foreign Office as being more short-termist, having to deal with day-to-day -day politics compared with DFID, which seems to me an instrument of soft power, rather like um, the BBC, for example. And I just hope 
that it will mean that DFID informs policy making uh, rather than that DFID becomes subject to short term concerns. Um, on greed versus grievance, you know, what I really think is uh, the trouble with greed versus grievance is that it still does assume a contest, but people are either contesting about money or they're contesting about political concerns. I actually think in these situations you get a kind of um, blurring of the difference between the political and the economic. Are militias there because are militias undertaking looting and pillaging because it's a way of financing their extremist political ideas? Or are they using the narrative of extremist Islam as a cover for their looting and pillaging activities? It's probably both, but that's it. So it's it, our kind of social condition is a real integration, if you like, of greed and grievance. And then the final issue I wanted to talk about is the UK after Brexit. Actually, our programme, although this was three, four years ago now, but our predecessor programme and mine were very involved in helping to write the conflict part of the global strategy, which is actually multidimensional and multi-level and has a lot in common with, there's some differences, but for the purpose, I won't go into it. I think the UK played a hugely important role in European external policy. I mean, Alex can talk about that much more in relation uh, to the Horn of Africa, where actually I think British withdrawal is, a re is you know, it's ch ch undermined Amazon and all of this kind of thing. But um, I think actually we had an enormously uh, productive outlet in the European security and defence policy and British played a very key role. I mean, one of the key roles we played was taking a lead in uh, the Gulf anti-piracy force, uh, which was really quite effective and we can talk about that. Um, so I suppose what I would say is for the UK after Brexit, I hope we continue to work as closely as we can with the Europeans because none of this is going to work unless it's done within a multilateral framework. And the European Union in the conflicts that we look at has the most to lose by failing to address these conflicts and the biggest opportunities to do something about them. It's been very feeble up till now, but, um, and, and that's why it makes it so sad that the UK is not part of it. Uh, but I really think if we could push the European to, the Union to a more political approach in places like Syria or the Horn of Africa, that could be incredibly important. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, I see, having posed the question to all the panelists, I see a whole uh, array of questions have come in from the audiences. So I might ask that, that we stop there for the moment, just hold for the panelists and turn to some of the questions from our, our audience. As others answer it on the panel, they can of course address anything that Julian or Christopher has said as well. So, so let me just flag one of them for a start. This was addressed to all speakers uh, by, um, Zian, Zianis Bukankin, Director of Foreign Police and Security Research Center. How will change involving the UK in conflict resolution in the post-Soviet era, uh, how will change involving, sorry, I see the UK in conflict resolution in post-Soviet era, I suppose change after Brexit. So it's, a, it's something that you've alluded to, but perhaps more directly, if um, perhaps, um, I'm not sure who would want to uh, to to speak to. I, I feel it shouldn't be me, but I'm the only one who actually studies post-Soviet conflicts. The question mean post-Soviet or post-Brexit? Oh, just the question. The question means post-Soviet space, and I suppose one might be thinking about Armenia and Azerbaijan. I think that's probably a good starting point for it. Yeah. Um, but how will? Um, oh, it's post. Post-Soviet space after Brexit, what would the UK, what would the UK's position be on conflict resolution? I think it's a better way to rephrase it. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, what we're trying to argue for is a change position, which I would argue for whether we were part, whether it was Brexit or not. Um, obviously, the European Union has a really effective role. If we take the case of um, Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, the three members of the Minsk group are France, the US and Russia, and France is a member of the EU. Nevertheless, the EU has been hugely important and so has the OSCE, the Minsk group is part of the OSCE in this conflict, but actually it's playing a minor role. The key actors here are Russia and Turkey. And the UK certainly, I think only by allying with Europe can offer a different kind of perspective to Russia and Turkey. So I'd hope there wouldn't be that much change and that we would work very closely with the European Union on these, whether we're talking about the Balkans or um, I mean, or the Caucasus or Moldova or Ukraine, of course, which is hugely important. Okay. D does anyone else want to come in on that particular question or shall we move on? I think just one quick comment. I think one of the tools that will be more available now to the UK to use after Brexit to influence these areas is sanctions. Uh, because you know, sanctions is one of the tools that you can use to affect the political marketplace. And uh, right now, all the sanctions uh, that UK kind of joined are the EU sanctions that have to be achieved after you know, all the EU countries agreeing on them. So there wasn't a lot of room uh, for the UK to push its own agenda right uh, after Brexit. The UK is out of the EU sanction system and they can redesign a sanctions, a new sanction system to uh, affect policy in these areas. Thank you. Let, let me jump to another question. Rob Morris, Learning Advisor, Conflict Sensitivity Resource Facility in South Sudan has this question, directs it towards toward uh, Mary, Alex, and Rim. We often hear a lot about what academics and analysts are going to do to develop more practitioner-friendly products to understand conflict and public authority. But from an academic perspective, what, what could diplomats, donors, and aid workers be doing to understand these conflict dynamics to inform their decision-making uh, beyond the re reading their papers, that is to say, academic papers? Alex should answer this. Thank you. Um, well, the first thing to say about that actually is that uh, in comparison with decades past, the um, FCDO staff and personnel at all levels are actively engaged in these types of very interesting discussions. And, 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 and I think um, I'm mean, just the very posing of this question is, 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 is uh, a testament to that. So I think there's a, you know, we're starting from a very strong place in terms of, of, of engagement and, and sort of inquiry on the part of, of, uh, of, of, of practitioners. Let me sort of slide off into an interesting element there, which was something that Julian mentioned about um, co-option which is that, of course, you know, co-option will always happen and we will always be at a disadvantage for two reasons. Number one, we don't know the local realities as well as the people who are there. And second, we, we have sets of norms and principles which, um, which, and, and scruples that some of the locals don't have and the people with less scruples always you know, will win in, 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 in the short term. But I think it's... Um, Two things are, 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 are of value here. One is this kind of exercise of, of being aware of the, the pitfalls and being able to uh, make candid assessments and have sort of metrics for identifying you know, where the dangers lie and what, how these systems will function um, if they function as they normally do. So we can, as it were, take out some of the optimistic or subjective assumptions that we often go into these situations with like oh this is our guy this is a good people or whatever you know screen those out and and and, and assess um the situation with 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 a little more clarity and it would be useful um to to reducing co-option but the other element is that co-option can actually also go both ways 
which is that local humanitarians, local civic actors can co-opt our support. And they can often do it in ways that we don't fully realize. So that one of the things that has been very noticeable in, in the Horn of Africa over the decades is that the, the presence of the humanitarians ranging from the, the NGOs to the UN to the donors has provided a sort of gainful employment and personal protection to a whole category of people who would otherwise probably not have survived either physically, they would have either been killed or had to leave, or pursuing their, you know, their, their personal and professional and, and moral interests in their countries. So we, we, we provide um, our, our employment, our, our, our resources are co-opted by a whole lot of civic actors over the years. Who, who, um, who then will use those, maybe in, not ways, in ways that we don't anticipate, but to support um, agendas that we generally speaking agree with. So there's, there's, that two-way co-option is something that we should be um, aware of and, 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 and perhaps continue to turn something of a blind eye towards. Uh, let me leave it at that. Would anyone else want to comment on that? If not, let me let let uh, let me turn to another question. Liam O'Shea, who's cu currently at the FCDO and will soon be a, a, a Deanum Fellow in a, the International Relations Department. Uh, his question is: What is the impact of the, that COVID is having on political marketplaces, and what should the FCDO do differently in response? He is, says he's particularly interested in the impact of COVID-19 on developing countries' security sectors. Well, this is both Reem and Alex. Yeah. Um, perhaps, Alex, you start. So a couple of, of, of key points, of course, we don't really know, but a couple of key points. One is it's accelerating the decarbonization, the, the, the um, collapse in oil prices and so on. So many of these countries that are dependent on, on, on oil exports, that the shift away from oil dependency is being accelerated. And in turn, I would expect um, the, the major oil producers that are not of immediate concern to us, you know, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, um, will be recalibrating their strategies for the wider region. And actually this brings me back to a point that, that Julian made earlier, which is the, the Gulf partners, how we engage with them. Because quite often um, looking at the, the, the relationships between the Gulf and, and, and the UK also, I'm speaking from the US here in the US, sometimes the because of their ready money, the Gulf partners are able to exercise leverage and influence on domestic policies outside in, in the West in a way disproportionate to their, their, their um, wider significance to, to, um, to our countries. Um, but I think the, the uh, engaging with them in, in a look, exploring how they are going to adjust to a post-carbon world and how they are going to then engage in the, the, the wider neighborhood where they will have food security interests, interests in not um, having unstable neighbors whose populations will be migrating en masse to where the money is. These sorts of issues, I think, be, I mean, there, there are a lot of conversations are already ongoing, I, I know, but we can, we can accelerate those. The other element that I think we need to be aware of in, in the impacts of COVID is that the, um, one of the things that's happening with the, the lockdowns and, 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 and the, the, the intense pressure on small businesses is this is an opportunity for large businesses to, to sweep up, to, to, to sweep up that market share. And, uh, and, and, and we're seeing in, in some countries, I mean, what the, an, an increase in the, uh, the domination of the larger corporations and in their political influence. I mean, one of the most shocking things has been the uh, acceleration in slum clearances in, in Nairobi, um, where you have particular you know, commercial interests in land, in urban land, 
provoking government, the government to say, okay, let's clear these, these areas because you know, we, the commercial interests have cash in hand that, can, that, that you need, you politicians, at a time of straightened circumstances. And a time when people are being told to stay home, how ridiculous and appalling is it that people's homes are being destroyed? Um, so uh, those are a couple of, of, uh, of issues. I'm sure there are many more. Let me hand over to, to Reem. Yeah, I, I, time is, is uh, running out here. So what I thought I would do is uh, um, ask the last two questions and have uh, any of the panelists who feel they'd like to answer it to, to jump in. One of them is um, how one deals with, with the United States uh, and, and its rejection of multilateralism in, in, in terms of solving global problems and, and promoting conflict as the, as the speaker suggests for its own purpose. That's Rosemary Ghali, who's an LSE alumni, and the other is Amri uh, Fami, King's College, MA student and Egyptian diplomat. How practical is it to expect political leaders who would be willing to be inclusive uh, with respect to civic actors, especially in the conditions when they're designated as, as terrorists, enemies, opponents in their propaganda narratives or benefit from violence? So again, the U.S. <laughs> someone wants to to tackle that, uh, as, and uh, the other one is is on uh, um, uh, responding uh, responding to um, these political leaders and the inclusion of civic actors who are pre designated as the other. Yeah. Are we, are we yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, let me just uh, answer the issue of inclusion uh, again from the example of Syria. When civil society was kind of asking the UN envoy to include them in the process, there was opposition from both sides, from the opposition and certainly uh, from the regime. Um, the risk was particularly on those who live in government areas who had been to, you know, had to leave Syria, go to Geneva and go back and to ensure that they're gonna be safe, given that uh, as the person who asked the question rightly said that often those people were labeled by the Syrian government as terrorists. Um, uh, it was very difficult, but it was possible because enough pressure was uh, applied on the regime to protect them. Uh, and actually the UN intervention here in a way uh, uh, gave them protection, even when they go back in their area, they were able to be more active, they were visible, they were, people were listening to them more because now they're seen as, you know, people who uh, uh, can resolve problems, can speak to the envoys. So they were empowered by uh, their participation. Uh, I think also when, when the UN and other actors are willing to involve these civic actors, they can apply enough pressure if they want uh, on these political leaders to ensure that these civic actors remain protected. Until now, we don't have a case on one of uh, those actors being subject to uh, any harm because of um, their participation. Actually, as I say, their participation formed, uh, 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 gave them a, a form of protection and it reinforced the idea that civil society was always you know, trying to uh, uh, say is that we are not terrorists, we're just people who, who are uh, trying to help. We don't want just to overthrow the regime for the sake of, uh, you know, building a, uh, an extreme state. We just want to build a, a, a democratic country. So it is possible, but certainly it was, um, it was not easy. It was not even easy for civil society to convince the UN and the envoys of even Russia and other countries that they should add this pressure in order to uh, ensure that civic actors are involved in the talks. Can I come in on a couple of those? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I mean, just why, why let civic actors in? Um, I think on that, just briefly, um, labels change as incentives in the balance of power changes. And I think that the, we, the international community, can sometimes be part of shaping that shift on how we support processes. I mean, just looking at Sudan, uh, the civic actors on the streets uh, at the beginning of uh, 2019 um, have very different labels now to what they had then. And um, so logics can change. Um, but I mean, I think there's a huge amount more one could explore on that. I'm not quest um, This could answer a couple of the questions here, but I would just say, 
um, multilateral frameworks and, 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 and alliances are critical to success in, in any of these approaches. So European partners will be key allies on a broad range of the challenges that we face, certainly in the region that I deal with. Um, and now I have an opposite, opposite number in the EU Special Representative for the Horn of Africa, who's a really close partner. Um, so, and I'm sure that that sort of replicates itself, uh, including also with other um, partners, not just the European Union. And then just lastly, a very brief comment on, on, on the strategy point. Can you, your question at the beginning is, is, is a 10 year strategy too much? Or, um, I would say actually, yes, we should, uh, we do try to sort of create longer term strategies. We will of course have to adapt those strategies to, to, to what happens. Um, will that happen more or less? Uh, Mary's worry about um, FCDO. Um, from my own perspective, I mean, I've, I've straddled both departments in many of my jobs uh, when they were there, but I would say the kind of access, including from the conflict research program, which I have enjoyed for some time, is now the kind of access which all of my colleagues in the former SEO will more easily and institutionally be able to access. Um, and I think, you know, policymakers want more of this. Uh, and, 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 uh, and the expertise that we're absorbing from former DFID helps us do that. And I would also just observe when in, in, in 2018 we were developing the new strategic approach to Africa, uh, which it was a very, very interesting exercise in blending uh, the shorter term horizons that the Foreign Office traditionally had with the longer term development interests, which um, DFID had traditionally focused on. And it wasn't a competition, it was actually a blending, it was actually looking at actually by merging these two and bridging the gap. We often found that the medium term was the bit that we hadn't thought about when we were two separate departments. So actually I would push back and say I think there's a huge opportunity here to make sure that we're looking at the full arc from the short term transactionalism, which is a part of real life in the world, right through to the long term strategies which show us where we should be going for with some of the middle term ground which we need to build on and exactly this kind of um, research and analysis granularity will allow us to address better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I fear we have run out of time but I think that's an, a good place to have, have uh, stopped our, con our, our conversation if not our overall discussion. I think it's the place for a beginning of another discussion and to be picked up uh, by, by all the panelists. Thank you to the Conflict Research uh, Program for uh, uh, producing this report and uh, with it generating this very incisive debate. And thank you to all the panelists and the discussants, as well as the audience for, for uh, generating such a good uh, and lively uh, discussion around this topic. Th thank you again, and we will see you at, I hope, a future event.